Welcome to the three championship drive podcast on YouTube hosted by me, Lance Caparossi. Follow me on X at Lance Caparossi the same way you see it on the screen and check out three championship drive, the podcast on Spotify, Apple, Google, or wherever you listen to podcasts. So do me a favor and subscribe Then do me another favor, favor and tell a Pistons fan. Real quick before we get into this podcast, man, huge shout out to the Detroit Lions. Two playoff wins. I expected one this year, one playoff win, and I got two. Incredible. They are one game away from the Super Bowl. That was such an awesome game. I just remember growing up watching the Detroit Lions since I was probably like 10 or 11 years old. Never, never imagine them going to the Super Bowl. I didn't think it was possible. I thought, dude, if you're a Detroit team, especially if you're a Detroit football team, you're never going to have that type of success. And man, I am just elated. It's incredible. Dan Campbell, Brad Holmes, Jared Goff, all those guys doing whatever they can. And they are so close, so close. I just, I'm so excited for him. It's just incredible. I mean, man, there's nothing else to say. It was just such a joyous, just, just a great win. It was awesome. It was awesome. I'm so happy for those guys. Let's get into this though. So John Sally, former Detroit bad boy says the Pistons should have hired Bill Lambeer as the head coach. You know, I've heard this from a lot of fans there have been other former Pistons that have talked about this as well. So John Sally was on the Run It Back podcast when he said Bill Lambeer should have been the head coach of the Detroit Pistons. He wishes that the Detroit Pistons had kept it all in-house. He goes on to say they only hired Vinny Johnson and Rick Mahorn to do play-by-play. He forgets to mention Joe Dumars, and Joe Dumars was hired by the Pistons, and he did build the going-to-work squad that won another championship, and I thought it was kind of crazy that he forgot that. But I do agree with him, not in the sense that I think Bill Ambeer should have been the head coach of the Detroit Pistons, even though I am a little surprised they didn't give him the opportunity, especially once... Larry Brown and Flip Saunders had been retired. I mean, we went through some dark times with John Kuster and Michael Curry as the head coach. I think Bill Lambeer probably at least should have gotten a shot during those years at some point. I don't know. I mean, he did win two championships with the Detroit Shock, and then he won a more recent one with the Las Vegas Aces. So he's won three. So, you know, he could win at the professional level. I do know the WNBA is a different game. And I don't know. I think really what happened with Bill Lambeer was just his reputation. He was blacklisted from the NBA because of how he played on the court and how he treated players off the court. He was known as a guy that only had friends in Detroit. He didn't have friends with other guys inside the NBA family. He had this whole I don't care attitude, and that's fine. But unfortunately, people remember, and when the guys you're playing with against that already have a bad taste in their mouth from those playing days are in positions to hire you, they're probably going to look the other way, and they're going to look towards another candidate. I don't think Bill Lambeer did himself any favors as a player. and But I mean, who would have known at the time? You're just being competitive, and you're just playing on the floor. So who's thinking you know what, once my career's up, I might go into coaching. I better be nice to these guys because if I'm not, they might not hire me. Nobody's thinking that way. So it is kind of sad that it is held against him instead of, you know, former players that had those GM roles just looking and saying, you know what, he was just competing on the floor. It's not that big of a deal. We were all competing. We all took some vicious hits. We all played a little dirty. That could have been it. But he didn't. He did have one cup of coffee in the NBA. He was with the Minnesota Timberwolves as an assistant under Kurt Rambis for, I want to say, two seasons. And that time in Minnesota for Bill Lambeer, it, it, came, it came with mixed results. Now, on one hand, people really respected him for the X's and O's. 
when it came to basketball and drawn up plays. He was respected in terms of developing players because if you had just looked how his teams were coached, now the players improved in the WNBA, they thought, yeah, he could probably carry it over. The problem was is just his personality as a coach. He had fits with people. He didn't get along with people. There were times that they thought practice was going to end in a fight. And there was this one – I didn't read the whole thing. I just read a small little a little blurb on it where I guess he was talking to Joe Dumars, and he said, we did a non-contact practice. What is that? So it's like he was complaining about the way things were done in the NBA. He didn't agree with it. And – yeah, you know, I mean, and after those two seasons, he got no real other shot to be in the NBA. So he decided to go back to the WNBA, where again, like I said earlier, he did find success winning another championship with the Las Vegas Aces. I will say that I know when I said earlier, like they was really respected for the X's and O's, but I looked at the stats for the the Aces when he was coaching them. He didn't play modern basketball. He was playing more of a stone age. Let's throw it in the paint. We're going to, it's going to the big man. That's how we play. They were near the bottom, if not all the way at the bottom in three point, three pointers attempted. And that's just the way the game is moving. We're looking for space. We're looking for more three point shots. We're not looking to just throw it in the post and everybody just kind of get out of the way and let the big man do work. Now, I know it worked in the WNBA, but it's a whole different game in the NBA, just different athletes. That's no disrespect. That's just the way it is. So for Bill Lambeer, I'm sorry you didn't get your shot coaching in the NBA. It's unfortunate you didn't get a shot with the Detroit Pistons, but hey, you're a champion in the NBA. You're a champion in the WNBA, and I believe he is looking – to uh, I think he just got nominated to be in the Basketball Hall of Fame. So hopefully that works out for Bill Lambeer. But he's a champion, and he's revered in Detroit as one of the best ever put on the jersey. So that's something. The Detroit Pistons are heading to Amazon Prime. This is – I'm not going to talk about this a lot just because I just really want to mention it. So Amazon bought Diamond Sports after bankruptcy deal. Diamond Sports owned – Bally Sports, and I believe they own 18 sports networks, and that's what Amazon is getting. So pricing and availability on Prime Video will be announced at a later date. I'm seriously hoping, one, there isn't blackouts. I would hate, even though I'm already paying for Amazon Prime, but if like, let's just say I had to pay like an extra 12 bucks a month to watch the Pistons. Okay, I'm going to do it, but if I don't get every game i understand like if they're saying like hey you're gonna get 81 out of 82 that's fine if i have to miss one okay no big deal but i've been able to for like the last three or four years i've been able to catch every pistons game and i want to keep that going even if they are bad so i'm hoping there's no blackouts with the uh, amazon prime deal and really honestly i'm hoping there's no extra charges i am expecting extra charges i just don't want extra charges when it comes to this i just want to be able to watch the pistons in peace that is all and if i have to keep doing what i'm doing now that's fine i'll i'll continue doing it no big deal but i would prefer to watch it in an app even if it is on amazon prime i do want to say though i did like bally sports the app when it did work like i did like it i liked watching it on my phone I like that I could tap the screen and I had an option to see players' stats live in the game. I know you have the ticker going at the bottom, but it always feels like it's just showing me, you know, scores from other games or from other sports, and that's fine. I get that. We do need that. I want to keep you updated through it all. But show me some stats in the game that I'm watching. That's what I want. And Bally Sports... It was cool because you could like click the player and they would show you everything. I thought that was a neat little feature for Bally Sports. But unfortunately, there were too many crash crashes, especially like now. It these last few months, it's been kind of difficult to use where you're almost gambling a little bit. You don't know if you're gonna get the game on your TV or your phone when you're watching. And it's unfortunate. You know, I mean, I thought it was a great idea. I'm totally in on Detroit sports having their own network, I would pay for something like that. If I could get Lions, Tigers, Pistons, Red Wings on one app, I'll 
I'll pay 10, 12 bucks a month for it. I got no problem, but that's not what we're getting. But anyways, that is one little bit of news that I have. The Detroit Pistons are heading to Amazon Prime along with the Red Wings and along, you know, along with the Detroit Tigers. This is a topic that, you know, I've been seeing it on social media quite a bit, especially with the injury to Cade Cunningham. And it's, can Cade Cunningham and Jade and Ivy coexist on the floor together? It has to work with, with these two. There's too much invested in Cade being the number one overall pick. Jaden Ivey being fifth overall, he has a game that does complement Cade Cunningham as an off-ball player. And I think that's where it's going to have to work for these two. They're both going to have to continue to work as off-ball players. Listen, I love what Jaden Ivey's doing on the ball. I think it's great. He is, there's no other option. We have nobody else. And I mean, you could probably say Alec Burks, but when it comes to the young guys, it's Jade and Ivy when Cade's now down on the floor. But don't get it wrong. It is Cade Cunningham's team. This is the guy. He is the gas, the oil, the engine to make everything run. Without him, this is going to be a very long rebuild. But with Cade as the point guard, as the lead guard, you're in good hands. So I would say it's Cade's team. And Jaden Ivey has to play off of him. That doesn't mean Jaden Ivey can't bring the ball up and run the offense. It's just that I would rather see it be more of Cade Cunningham. I want there to be a pecking order. I want there to be some hierarchy between these two. I want it to be Cade at the top and then Jaden Ivey number two. That is what I want to see. That is how you're going to find success with these two. And I really think it depends on Jaden Ivey. You know what I'm saying? Like we're seeing Cade play off the ball and there is some success where it's like okay yeah i could see us going with another lead guard out there because he has shown to be that he can find success playing off the ball with that because he does have great size for the point guard and for the three spot like he can do it and when you're looking at ivy and you kind of got to blame coaching with it there's a lot of times he's just running to the corner and you don't know what's happening it's just like okay is he taking himself out of the play or is this really what's being designed because this seems like a huge waste of his abilities if it's going to work i want to see ivy in different actions i want to see him in catch and shoots he's developed that three-point shot it has looked a lot better he's had a handful of games where he's had multiple three-pointers this season and if he de continues to develop that catch and shoot that catch and drive game is going to open up for him. He catches it in that first step. It is so lethal. Nobody can stay in front of him. That's how it's going to work with these two. And also what I would love to see the Pistons do in order to maximize Ivy's athleticism and speed. I want to see him run around like Rip Hamilton. If you go back and watch him in Purdue, this dude was so good at running off screens and navigating the defense to find open spots against the defense to get an open shot or, you know, pump fake one dribble to the rim that those are the things Ivy could do. We saw it in college. I want to see him do more handoffs again. It's all about getting him going downhill. And this is not something, this is something you can do when Cade runs the offense. And then, you know, when you're getting a dribble handoff, whether it's from Dern or Isaiah Stewart, whoever else is out on the floor, then Cade can move to the off ball when Jade and Ivy has it, but these are the actions I want to see. Because if you start getting Jade and Ivy going downhill, good luck to any defense defending him. And I want to see more cuts. That's that's another thing that's going to make this work. I really do think the the backcourt duo, the potential, really depends on what Jade and Ivy does off the ball. I know I said Cade earlier, but again, Cade has found success but I really think it depends on Jade and Ivy. We can't have him tucked in the corner just standing still. We have to see this guy move on the offense. That's the only way it's going to work. And there's one final thing I want to say. Stagger the minutes between these two. You know what I'm saying? You could ha literally have one of these two guys on the floor all the time. I want to see him make it work together, and I am confident that they'll make it work together. But again, stagger their minutes where – you know, Cade's running the show for a little bit. Then Jaden Ivey's running the show for a little bit. That is something I would like to see, and that is how I think it's going to work. If 
And I don't really think it's that complicated. You know, I mean, we're sitting here watching it and you're just like kind of blown away a little bit where you're like, I don't get what we're doing. We basically have like a jumbo Chris Paul in Cade Cunningham, but yet we're sticking Jaden Ivy, the best athlete on this team in the corner. Mind you, the best athlete with the most skill, you know, and he's just being wasted sitting in the corner and not doing anything else offensively. Like there are certain things you can draw up where he doesn't need the ball in his hands, where you can quickly get the ball to his hands, where then he you can maximize his abilities. And we're just not seeing it, man. It's it can be disgusting sometimes watching these games because you're just you're scratching your head, just wondering why. What the f- what are we doing? You know. So there's a trade. There's actually multiple trades that have been happening with the Pistons. It seems like every player that's available for trade, the Pistons are in on it. So I'm going to talk about one. And it's with the New York Knicks, and I really do love what the New York Knicks are putting out there. So the Knicks are dangling Quentin Grimes, Evan Fournier in draft compensation for a potential upgrade. This comes from Michael Scotto. Look, I'm Troy Weaver. I'm on the phone. I'm talking to the New York Knicks. I'm trying to get something done because you get Quentin Grimes, who's a, you know, he looked fantastic as a rookie, as that three and D guy. He performed well in the playoffs. Then you're potentially getting your first round draft pick that you traded that is very heavily protected. And you're able to get that back. And then you're able to get Evan Fournier back, which I don't know a lot of, I don't know how other Pistons fans feel about him, but I'm going to be honest with you. I think he's a pretty solid player that's just kind of getting, he's just in the doghouse when it comes to the New York Knicks. So he was, he signed with the New York Knicks in 21, 22. He played 80 games, started all 80 games. He played 30 minutes per game. He shot 42% from the field. 39% from three on eight attempts and averaged 14 points, three rebounds, two assists, and a steal. Look, he's not going to be like tearing it up defensively. That's not what I'm looking for from Evan Fournier. I'm just looking for him to be offense off the bench. So I'm going to give you two trades here in a second. You know, and then back in 2020 and 21, 26 games, 26 starts, he's averaging 20 points per game for the Orlando Magic. And I know they weren't a good team and they need someone to shoot the ball, but. He's only 31 years old. I just think he's in the doghouse in New York, and there's still a lot of game left for Evan Fournier. And plus, I really think this guy would welcome a trade to the Detroit Pistons because it would give him an opportunity to showcase that he still has basketball skills and, you know, showcase his abilities to sign another contract. Cause I don't think this guy is ready to call it quits just yet. He's only 31 years old and he's only two seasons removed from averaging 14 points per game on pretty good numbers for the New York Knicks. That's why I would jump on this and his contract. I'll share it here. So this is, it's not his final year, but it kind of is, is his final year at 18.8 million. And the reason it's kind of his final year is that there's a team option for the 20, 2024, 25 season for 19 million, which I think if he, you know, if he's kind of playing that Alec Burke role, that Alec Burke's role, I think he can still find a shot and be an efficient scorer off the bench in 19 million. I mean, it's kind of high, but also the salary cap is going up. And it's not something I don't even think the Pistons actually exercise it. I just think they let him go because I still think you'd be gambling a little bit because he's pretty much had two mediocre years with the New York Knicks playing under Thibs. So it is a little bit of a gamble with Evan Fournier, but I still think there's a player there. And again, contract is basically coming up this year and it's a $19 million guaranteed if the Detroit Pistons were to trade him and then actually you know pick up the option heading into the off season so i got two trades going to the knicks and i'm going to share them with you guys right now so my first trade is boyan for evan fournier and grimes and then detroit's first round pick back from the knicks the only problem with this trade is 
Detroit will be loaded with guards. I mean, I think there'd be eight guards on the roster, and I don't know how you give minutes to all of these guys. So I'm not really in favor of this one, and I'm still a huge fan of Boyan, even though he's 35 years old and you're getting basically two players and your first-round pick back from the Knicks, which opens up so many other possibilities for trades for Troy Weaver or whoever the next GM is. But that's one trade. The second trade, and this is the trade I'm more interested in, In the second trade is Alec Burks and Killian Hayes for Fournier, Grimes, and Detroit's first-round pick back. The reason I'm interested in that one is, one, you're getting rid of Killian Hayes. That era is done in Detroit. And I am, I'm washing my hands of it. I'm totally fine with Killian Hayes' time being up in Detroit. I think it's been costly to the development of Sasser, Ivy, Asar. I just think it's, at this point, you know what he is. Good luck on your next team. Alec Burks has been playing phenomenally. I don't think, even though, I think in his last three games, he's been averaging 28 or 26 points per game which is crazy efficiency i mean if you watch the pistons you're seeing this guy cook every single night regardless of who is in front of him he has been playing great but even though he's been playing so well i don't think his trade value has gone up that much i just think it's where it is and that's why i think if you can get your former first round pick back from the knicks and that, again, like I said, opens up other possibilities. But then you're getting a young 3 and D guy in Grimes, and you're getting a guy in Evan Fournier who has proven throughout his career to be able to score the basketball that could fill in for Alec Burks. Not saying he'll perform like Alec Burks. I'm just saying you could put him in that role, and he can put the ball in the hoop. That is what Evan Fournier can do. I think that would be a great trade. I'll trade Alec Burks, and I'll trade Killian Hayes for Grimes and Fournier and the Pistons' first-round pick back. I got no problem with that. I think that is as good as it's as good as it's going to get for Burks and Killian Hayes, who Killian Hayes, I mean, I don't even think he has much trade value right now, but I also think if you're the New York Knicks, you have Jalen Brunson, and I think Malachi Flynn is the backup point guard for the Knicks right now, but I think you're also using Dante DiVincenzo as the point guard, and I'm not sure who else. Maybe you're having some other guys bring the ball up the floor. Killian Hayes, I mean, dude, he takes care of the ball. And I forget who posted. I think it was NBA University. He was, like, second or third in, like, playmaking stats as a facilitator, or maybe it was B-ball index. But one of those ones were put Killian Hayes on a positive list for playmaking. So you're getting a guard that can, with the offensive players you have on that team, He'll get some assist and he'll take care of the ball and he'll play a little bit of defense. I think it's a win-win for both teams and it doesn't seem like trades always happen that way when it comes to professional sports. It always seems like one team is coming out on top versus the other one. So I got one more trade to talk about and it's not with the New York Knicks. I promise you it's not with the New York Knicks. It is with the Oklahoma City Thunder and a couple of other teams. So about a month ago, James Edwards from The Athletic reported that the Boston Celtics, the Oklahoma City Thunder, and the Dallas Mavericks have expressed interest in Isaiah Stewart. They're all looking for a stretch big for their teams. Everybody wants Isaiah Stewart, and he's probably not a starter on any of these teams, but he's part of their rotation. And then going into the playoffs when teams you know, cut their rotation back. He's probably going to be a part of the playoff rotation. And it makes sense for all three of these teams. Isaiah Stewart in a bench role would be fantastic. I just don't think he's a full-time starter in the NBA. You guys have heard me say that before. I, I'll, I'm i going to eliminate one team already, Boston. I just don't really like what Boston has on their team. I mean, outside, I mean they do have a really well-put-together team. I just don't know if you're getting close to the same value for Isaiah Stewart if you're going with Boston. I mean, I'm kind of interested in Sam Hauser because he's a guy that can spread the floor and he does play decent defense for the Boston Celtics. That's a name I would look for. But outside of that, I mean, 
obviously you're not getting Tatum or Brown back in any of these trades. You're not getting Holiday. You're most likely not getting Al Horford. You're not getting Chris Stop. So I haven't really looked at Boston's roster in a minute, but I know Sam Hauser, that was a name that had piqued my interest a little bit, even though I don't, but I'm eliminating Boston. I don't want to trade with Boston. I'm looking at the Oklahoma City Thunder, and there was an article written by Bleacher Reports. What's his name? Eric Pincus, I believe is how you say his last name. I've been known to get names wrong, so I do apologize. But he says, a less expensive name to watch is Isaiah Stewart, the Detroit Pistons. While they just traded Marvin Bagley the third to Washington, if Detroit is open to moving the 6A forward, they can probably get a strong return from Oklahoma City. Draft compensation and perhaps Trey Mann or Dang. Usman Dang. I'm not interested in trading with the Oklahoma City Thunder. I'm going to make it very clear. Like, I mean, unless you're going to give multiple first-round picks back for Isaiah Stewart, I don't want Trey Mann. I'm good with Trey Mann. I just think, I don't think it's a huge upgrade. I mean, he's a six foot three point guard. He's played 13 games for the Thunder, averaging four points, two rebounds, two assists. And that's me rounding up. Now he is shooting 50% from the field and 42% from the three point line and 100% from the free throw line. But his career numbers are 40% from the field, 34% from three in 78% from the free throw line. And his numbers have dropped since his rookie year where he was getting 23 minutes per game. Every season it's dropped. He's out of the Thunder rotation. They have no use for this guy. I don't know how him coming to the Detroit Pistons who are already loaded, and I'm not even going to say loaded with talent at the guard spot, just have a lot of guards on the roster already trying to get minutes. I don't know what adding another guard to the mix does, especially one that has underperformed since his rookie year. I mean, if the 42% from three was legit, yeah, you might consider it, but he shot 36 his rookie year and then 31.5 his second year. In the field goal percentage, both seasons was at 39%. So I'm not buying it. It's just, it's not something that I want from the Oklahoma City Thunder. Then Usman Dang, or Usman Dang, excuse me. The only problem I have with that is the Pistons, they don't really have a great track record. Or Usman Jang, excuse me. They don't have a great track record for developing guys. Now, he's a power 40, 6'10", 216 pounds. He's played 22 games this year for the Oklahoma City Thunder and shooting 42 per, 42% from the field, 30% from three, and 83% from the free throw line. Career averages of 42, 28, and 71. So there's a little uptick in there from them. Those could be legit. But again, it's the Detroit Pistons, and I don't trust them to take a prospect like this and develop them. I don't know what that guy was thinking writing that that it would basically be a fair trade or an upgrade or whatever. It really wouldn't be. I don't even know who I'd want from Oklahoma City that's sitting on their bench. Maybe Isaiah Joe. But then we're getting back into the conversation of how many guards do you need on this team and who rises to the top from these guards, you know? I mean, you already know you got Cade and Jade and Ivy, but with everybody else, I don't know what you do, you know? So... I would have to say I'd be out on the Oklahoma City Thunder trade. Now, the Dallas Mavericks one, I'm going to pull up one trade. I'm a little interested with the Dallas Mavericks because maybe you can get Grant Williams back. And I know he's only getting paid about $12 million a year, I believe, after signing that contract with them. His numbers haven't improved, but this is a guy that, He has showcased an ability as a defender, as a guy that can space the floor, and a guy that can, you know, he can play the three or the four in the NBA, even though he's a little undersized to play that four spot. Decent rebounder, like I said, can get after it defensively, and again, another guy that can space the floor. If you're going to get rid of Isaiah Stewart, I want a guy that can play one of those forward spots and can be, you know, you can set him out on the perimeter and he can do a little bit of work. 
That's what I want in return. So there's this trade proposal basically by NBA analysis. And here's what they said. Here's their trade package. So the Dallas Mavericks, they would get Isaiah Stewart and the Detroit Pistons would get Greg Brown and a first round pick for Isaiah Stewart. I'm not a, so yeah, it's Greg Brown the third and then a 2027 first round pick lottery protector from Dallas. And then the Dallas Mavericks, they get Isaiah Stewart. I'm kind of interested in Greg Brown, but again, not for Isaiah Stewart. I feel like these trades have really undersold Isaiah Stewart's value, not only to the Pistons, but what he brings to other teams. This is a guy that can spread the floor. He's shooting 36% from three. He can protect the rim. He's has good footwork where he can make, when he switches, he can make things uncomfortable for guys on the perimeter. We've seen the highlights. We've seen him do this before. If you watch the games, Isaiah Stewart, he's a pretty, he's a pretty good defender when it comes to that. I'm not going to say he's elite, but he is a good defender. And I just think if I'm the Pistons and I am going to move on from a guy that I think many of us consider is the heart and soul of this team in a guy that maybe he's not a building block, but a guy that can help out the team in the future when he's playing in that perfect role, which I think is the backup five spot. I mean, man, we saw him play with the second unit, getting touches in the post, shooting the three, spacing the floor for Sar Thompson. It looks like it could work. But what I'm getting at is I don't want a prospect. I don't want a project. I don't want a reclamation player coming to the Pistons for Isaiah Stewart. If I'm going to trade Isaiah Stewart, and this is a big if, if I'm going to trade him, I want a player that can contribute right away. That is what I'm looking for if I'm the Detroit Pistons. It's sad and it'd be pathetic to get a reclamation project back. We've had to do that way too many times as fans. I don't want to sit through it. I don't want to give hope, whether it's Usman Jang or Greg Brown. I don't. I don't. I just want a guy that's going to help the Detroit Pistons. I don't want another guard. I would be looking into Isaiah Joe just because, dude, that's like the perfect name to be a Piston, Isaiah Joe. Come on, let's be for real. But other than that, I'm not really as excited in any of these trades I'm just not. There is one more that I found online, and it's – I'll read it for you guys. Just give me a second to pull it up. So this is with the Sacramento Kings. And I think this is – this might be the best one. So the Detroit Pistons would receive guard forward Chris Duarte in a 2026 first-round pick lottery protector from Sacramento. Then the Kings would receive Isaiah Stewart. I'm going to be honest with you. I think Isaiah Stewart and Sabonis would be one lethal combination in the front court. That would be so much fun to watch. You have that finesse, that playmaking from Sabonis, and then you have that, that ruggedness, that toughness, that hustle from Isaiah Stewart, a guy that doesn't back down from anybody. That would be honestly a great fit for the Kings. And I am interested in Chris Duarte. I'm going to be honest with you. I think he's a pretty solid player, man. I mean, I'm looking at the numbers right now and this just kind of sucks. <laughs> I just basically talked myself out of it just by looking at the numbers. So he's played 34 games for the Kings this year, averaging four points, two rebounds, one assist, shooting 36% from the field and 31% from three. I always had, yeah, his rookie year with Indiana, 55 games, 39 starts, averaged 13 points, but he was shooting 37% from three and 43% from the field. But then it just dipped to 37 and 32. And then it's even worse with the Sacramento Kings this year. You know what? I'm going to have to pass. I was, I had not looked at Chris Duarte's numbers at all. I just remember him being like a, Six six to six eight, you know, three or four that could hit an open three and spread the floor for you know your guards. And it doesn't even look like he can do that anymore. I'm not even going to talk about that trade. All of those teams, you can't have Isaiah Stewart with the packages that are apparently 
you know, coming up. And I'm just going to tell you, I don't even think those are all, any of those trades were actual reports. I think those were just writers coming up with like, Hey, this might work. And this is why we think a trade would work. I'm just disagreeing with them. I don't think it would work. I need something better back for Isaiah Stewart. So I want to thank you guys for listening to the three championship drive podcast. Do me a favor, go to Google, Apple, Spotify, or wherever you listen to the podcast and subscribe. After you subscribe, leave a review, drop a rating, vulner polls, and more importantly, tell a Pistons fan.